Octavio. Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah, the same problem with the sun settings. Okay. Okay, so everything works, everything's fine. I just share the screen. Desktop, um, whatever. Can everybody hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear us? I don't hear you. So, I think I need to check. Okay, try to speak now. Can you hear us now? Yeah. Okay, good. Okay. So uh, let's continue from the wherever we left. Um, I know that somebody of you had some issues uh, with the virtual machine. I should be okay. You should be able to download it. We updated it. We installed uh, many software uh, for Git, uh, for doing commits, for um, Spider as well. And you should be able to now have the code. Um, it, not really the latest one. So you need to, um, for the next exercise, which is uh, uh, the next lab uh, is L3. You, you will have to update it, but we will do it together. But at least the one that is inside the, the, the virtual machine, it should be um, consistent with this one. So do, did you, do you have any question till now? What, till what we did so far, the creation of a, uh, reference and the implementation of, of a joint PD control law. Okay. Yeah. So uh, we, in essence, the last exercise we did was to uh, implement a joint PD control law and to notice that one of the joints, the second one had a um, underdump behavior. And this underdump behavior uh, was, so you cannot see my face here. Can you see my face? Yes, we can see your face. Uh, this underdump behavior was due to the fact that the, we set a constant uh, proportional gain for all the joints. And since the inertia of the joint is different, uh, the, the, the value and also a constant uh, damping for the joints, uh, this will result in different uh, uh, natural damping, which means that we should not be able to achieve the same uh, transient on all the joint because to do that, we should be able to uh, tune separately the, um, the, the derivative gain KD to uh, uh, the inertia of each joint, seen by each joint. And each joint, depending on how many links has after uh, uh, himself, will have a different uh, inertia that is also dependent on the configuration. So uh, an interesting thing is also to uh, create a motion that is changing um, the configuration quite a lot and uh, see that the, uh, the damping term will change uh, much more for the joint that is, that is proximal to the base. So that is for, for which there is a big inertia change 
Uh, then for the last joint that is only uh, moving the uh, um, the last, uh, the, the, for example, the fifth one is only moving the last units. Um, so, for example, we can set these um, settings for the, the reference trajectory um, in the config file, which is x 2 count was already here. And we can print the KD in the case of the second joint. Remember, uh, in Python, we start from zero index. So this is second joint. And we also print it for the fifth joint. is fourth index because it's starting from zero. Okay, yeah, we should use the sinusoidal. Um, sinusoidal input, not the step one to see this. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, forgot. Thank you very much. Uh, an important thing: you should set uh, run configure and tick execute in a dedicated Python console and interact with the Python console, such that we can uh, play around with the after the running the the code. We can play around with the console to see, for example, the values of some variables. It's quite handy in Python. Yeah, so this is quite a bigger inertia. And you see here that the, the damping for the second joint is, is varying quite a lot, while the damping for the, for the fifth joint is just really uh, almost constant. And this is because the inertia is changing with the configuration. Um, so now, We go on with the next exercise. So we go back to the previous one. And the next exercise, we saw from these plots that we have quite a lot of uh, error, both during the steady state at the end, after the sign reference is finished, whenever the reference becomes constant. And we have errors also during, during the transient. And we have a lot of coupling in the joints that are not moving. Okay. So let's start to try to get a read of the steady state error, which is mainly, you know, due to gravity. It's position dependent. So we want to add a gravity compensation there to compensate the gravity forces at the joint. And to compute this, we again exploit the Pinocchio library and recompute at each loop for the uh, actual uh, position of the, of the angular position of the joint for the actual configuration, we compute the gravity, uh, the vector of gravity forces. And again, we wanna use the step reference to, uh, to check that the steady state error is gone. And uh, we are expecting that there is no longer a steady state error, but we expect that there is still a, 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 a tracking error during the transient. So let's do that. What we need to do in essence is nothing more. So we increase the size of the font also here. So we no longer print stuff. And in the, uh, instead of uh, doing just a PD, 
we copy over the same PD and we add what? We add the G term, which is that which are the gravity torques that we want to compensate. Okay, and then we run again the simulation. So this is the simulation with the, with the sinusoid. And we see that the bias that was present, for example, in the second joint, which is the one that needs to carry most of the weight, because the, the first joint is just uh, moving in this, in this plane, so it's not, not really affected much by the gravity. Uh, the, uh, the steady state error at the end is, is zero. But still, we see that we have um, some tracking error during the, during the, the transient for a time varying reference. Let's try with the, to do the same with our sign, uh, sorry, step. You see a step on the fifth joint and on the second joint. And if you look at the plot, we have that we don't have any steady state error, but we still have errors in the other joint that are supposed to don't move due to what? You remember the lecture on the dynamics? We studied that. What are these? Relatively. Inertial coupling. Exactly. Precisely. So if the other move, if this joint and this joint are moving, they affect because of the motion the other joints that are supposed to be still due to the coupling in the inertial matrix that is not diagonal. So the next exercise is to uh, first, before compensating the inertial coupling we see in the exercise uh, two, uh, let's try to improve a bit the uh, tracking during the transient because we improved the tracking uh, of the sinusoid uh, sorry, of the, um, of the resonance signal at the steady state, but we saw that the sinusoid in the second joint was not really properly tracking. So let's again restore the sinusoid, which is a time varying reference, because you remember the feed forward term only improves the tracking for a time varying reference. And to compute the feed forward term, we need to use uh, the inertia, right? We can employ the uh, diagonal, uh, the element on the diagonal because we are using a decentralized approach. Remember, we, we don't care about the other joints. Every, every joint's place alone is, is, is battle. And to compute the inertia, we need to use the desired trajectory because it's a feed forward term. So it's not, there is no feedback. There is no state with feedback. And, and so we need to get the acceleration of the joints and um, multiply them by the uh, inertia. So we go to the exercise. 1.7, we copy over whatever we did so far, which is the gravity compensation in the PD, and we want to add, we want to add the few forward term. So first, let's evaluate the, the, the matrix M at the desired trajectory that you remember is QD de, QDES. Uh, 
reference, we need to compute the inertia matrix for the desired trajectory, reference trajectory. And then we do M this dot what Q D D this. No, sorry. Uh, yeah. So to to do um, to take to extract the um, um, because we are using a decentralized approach, we need to take the element on the diagonal. Okay. So to take the element of the diagonal, the vector of 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 the diagonal element, we use the function np diag of m des and now pay attention we cannot do the dot product but we need to do again the coefficient wise product to multiply each element of the on the diagonal of the of the of the uh, inertia matrix with the relative correspondent joint variables which is qdd des Then we have a PD term and a gravity compensation. We simulate. And we see that the tracking was improved, is improved with respect to before, that you had that little overshoot, you remember. We saw that before. You still have some uh, uh, tracking issues here because of the discontinuity, because our reference is not smooth. And here we will see this this tracking error because to, what is due to. And again, we still have some inertial couplings that move the other joints. So now let's improve again this, this scheme um, and get rid also of the inertial couplings, implementing an uh, inverse dynamic scheme. So we are moving out from the decentralized approach and diving into a centralized approach wherever we take into account the interaction between the joints and we try to effectively compensate for this uh, interactions that are represented by inertial coupling, but also by the uh, correlates and centrifugal effort. And we can compensate them by linearizing this nonlinear dynamics effect via state feedback that we call feedback linearization. And this approach, uh, in case of articulated robot, takes the name uh, of inverse dynamics computed plot. Um, <clears throat> So we cancel these nonlinear terms uh, and we obtain a dynamics that is decoupled. And because it's decoupled, there, is no, there are no longer uh, couplings. And uh, this the dynamics is not only decoupled, but is also linear. And the basic idea is then to uh, design a second um, uh, control, uh, controller in the new coordinates like in the new control input uh, to satisfy our uh, control uh, uh, our control desires, which is to track improve our trackings. And therefore, we can, uh, if we remember, uh, implement this uh, control law that is uh, uh, our forward acceleration, desired acceleration for the joint plus a K P, K, D, uh, P, D in the joint space. And sorry, this, there is uh, an error here. Um, there is a parenthesis here. So this is the new input and um, that we set to track this, this, uh, uh, this control law. And the feedback linearization is just uh, 
summing the uh, Coriolis effect to uh, remove them and multiply by the inertia matrix. So in essence, if we want to implement, we already have the, all the ingredients because we do have the uh, inertia matrix, we do have the accelerations, and we do have the uh, Coriolis centrifugal and gravity terms that are represented by the vector H. So our torques are uh, M dot parenthesis QDD des. Note that we are not, for the fit forward term, we no longer multiply by the inertia because now if you apply the field linearization, we obtain a system of pure double integrator with, with um, unitary mass, unitary inertia. So we just set the um, QDD des, and then we have the PD part. Des minus Q. This is the proportional part, and then the derivative part is here at the velocity level. And out of this, we do have the uh, the compensation of the nonlinear uh, other nonlinear terms. Okay, so now let's try this. Prof. Prof. Yes. Uh, you should add the, the multiplication. Ah, yeah. Forgot. These are MP matrix and sorry, MP arrays multiplied by matrix. Okay, now if you look at the plot, we see a perfect tracking. We have a very small number here, so no inertia coupling, no inertia coupling here, no inertia coupling here, no inertia coupling here, and a perfect tracking all over the range, except really a very tiny, tiny error in here because the reference is not smooth. And in here. Why do you think we do have this this kind of uh, tracking error at the very beginning? What, what did this do for to in your opinion? So this, this error is due to the fact that our initial velocity is not consistent with the reference signal. Remember, a cosine at zero is one. So our QD des trajectory, if we plot, if we plot it, we have this velocity plot at the very end that we can already run in the console because we already run the simulation. And the velocity plot if you look at that you have that at the very beginning the desired signal starts from non-zero because the cosine is, is, is non-zero zero while the state starts from zero and this is creating this little tracking error. So if you wanna really have, you are very picky, and we wanna really have a perfect tracking, we should put what? The initial value of the QD zero um, consistent with the, uh, with the sign and this is exactly 
2 pi f times amplitude. Then let's try again and see if this was true. You see, we don't gonna have this stacking error at the position at the beginning and also at the velocity level. Okay, so this is very nice, very good, very ideal, I would say. But what happens if we have a non-perfect knowledge of our inertia and, uh, and our uh, bias terms? So, ah, first, uh, let wait. Uh, an important point I didn't say about inverse dynamics is that since we obtain a linearized system of double integrator, we could ideally uh, reduce the gains and achieve the same tracking, right? If there are no external disturbances. And in particular, uh, we should now, uh, to achieve critically damping, you need to set uh, two square root of Kp because now the inertia is unitary. So let's try first to reduce the gains of one fifth and like setting the KP to 60, for example. I think I, I, I can do it here. or write what I was done before. Time 60. And then let's compute the damping to have critical damping behavior. And we saw that we can remove, uh, sorry, this. Inertia part. And you will see that the tracking, even if we reduce the gains, is perfect. This is very good advantage of feedback linearization. Remember that whenever we were reducing the gains, if we had a PD control law, we would have bigger errors, bigger errors of the steady state, bigger errors of the transient. And a way to reduce the error was to increase the gains. Why? Here we have a we keep the perfect tracking, even though we are reducing the gains of our tractor. Okay. So if everything perfect, everything will be uh, tracking nicely. But what happens, for example, if we have an external force? So we try to add uh, an external force of fifty newton in the vertical direction. And we wanna, this external force start to act after three seconds. And to add an external force, you remember in our dynamics, we add the term J transpose uh, effects to the computed torque from the controller so in the dynamics. And, and we will see that we start to have tracking error the joint due to the fact that we are disturbing the motion of the robot uh, with this external force. And this uh, external force affects all the joint through the uh, um, J-tons pose. Okay. Now let's set a constant Q0 to better, better visualize this phenomena. So I will do two things. One, I will 
overwrite our reference to be always like this to zero. And then after my controller, I have a part with the uh, external force computation. And in essence, I add external force here. If it's bigger, time is bigger than three seconds, I apply the force. Otherwise, I don't. Then in the config file, I just set it to the external force flag. And here is whatever I set the external force to 50 Newton. Okay. Then once I computed this external force, which will be zero whenever uh, after three, uh, before three seconds and be uh, 50 in the, the direction after three seconds, I add to the tau the computation of the uh, of the uh, of this external force actually i should uh, i should do it here because this part of the dynamics and then i can uh, oh, exploit this function at add arrow to plot an arrow uh, we scale it to 100 because it will be too big. It will be 100 meter <laughs> to uh, to visualize this force. So we have a robot at Q0, and after three seconds, you see that the force is applied in the vertical direction. If we look at the plot, the tracking errors, this is uh, the initial transient. Um, we see here that we have this uh, error due to the action of external force. And let's check, I don't know, here we have a 0.5 uh, rad error. So now let's try to increase again the, the gains to what we had before, that was 300. And what do we expect from this? Since we have a linearized system, if we increase the gains, we expect that the tracking error would reduce of the same amount. So we increased five times because from 60, we went back to 300. We expect the, the tracking error on this variable is become one fifth. And we remember it was from uh, 0.5 to less than zero. And now is from 0.5 to 0.4. So now the tracking error is reduced from 0.5 to 0.1 exactly one bit. And this is for all the joint check. <clears throat> okay. Now let's see this important point. Uh, what is the reason uh, so what is the problem behind the implementation of, of inverse dynamics? You remember the cancellation. So we have our model of our robot that doesn't reflect exactly the real dynamics of the robot. So the, uh, the estimation that we have of the inertia matrix might not be accurate. And therefore, if we uh, try to cancel out the nonlinear effect and the, and the, and the inertia, we, we, we can get a uh, cancellation error and we might have tracking issues. So, but we want to evaluate uh, how much this 
uh, uncertainty affects our tracking and therefore we apply a 10 percent uh, variation uh, to scale the element of uh, the mass and the uh, correlates inertia and gravity uh, so correlates centrifugal and gravity terms that we use in our inverse dynamics team from the talk and we check how much is the degradation uh, remove we remove the external port as is, is no longer needed so in this case we remove it from here that's why I didn't put here and we take the um, inverse dynamics expression we replicate that here and instead of using m and h we use m hat which is 1.1 m and h hat which is 1.1 h and again we go back to our sinusoidal reference Okay, remember the tracking with the exact cancellation was perfect, both at the beginning and the, apart from the discontinuity of the reference, you had the same, but you remember had absolutely no inertia coupling. And here you start to have errors, tracking errors due to inertia coupling that are bigger than before. So before there were no error, now they used to start to happen. And also here you see that is the tracking is not perfect as before. But let's do something worse. Let's uh, instead of using the actual state to compute the inverse dynamics computer torque, let's use the desire states so we go back we remove the parametric uncertainty we assume that we have a perfect cancellation but we compute the m matrix using the desired term rather than the actual term and the same for the h matrix so Again, we take these two functions and we compute the inverse dynamics with the desired joint trajectory. You remember, in the case of inertia matrix, you have only dependency on the configuration, while in the case of the centrifugal chorus and gravity effect, you have dependencies both the configuration and the joint velocity. And then let's use this instead of M and use this instead of H. Okay, and see that uh, there is quite an error. We should evaluate how much was uh, the difference with respect to, to the previous case. No, sorry, with the previous case, we had the uncertainty. In this case, there is an error, even though we have a perfect cancellation. And this error is due to the fact that 
um, there is a difference, especially at the end here, whenever it's this tracking error, the desired value is um, different from the actual value. And therefore the cancellation worsened because we compute the cancellation for the uh, MDES matrix, uh, for the QDES, uh, we compute the inertia matrix for the QDES variable, not for the Q variable. And you see that you have an increase of, uh, of uh, tracking error in this, in this problem, in this moment. And you have uh, the inertia coupling that are starting to uh, play a role. So uh, don't use this approach if you can, never, um, because it can be very dangerous. Now, uh, until now, uh, we discussed about free motion, so no contact with the environment. And you remember that we explained several ways to implement and simulate the contact with the environment. And one of them was with a, a model of environment that is modeled with the, uh, compliant uh, uh, elements. So we want to complete this lab uh, considering the interaction with an environment uh, at the end effector and model this interaction using a compliant model with linear springs, KMV, and uh, uh, linear dampers dm where dm is a uh, three times three matrix as well as dm and we want to compute the uh, contact force that we will insert into the uh, dynamics okay through the jacobian transpose first let's consider the uh, contact new unilateral and allow the force to be generated only do along the z direction so the normal to the contact because we have the floor which is horizontal so the z direction is the normal <clears throat> and we need to remember that to compute the uh, um, the term of the damping in the in our compliant model, we need also the velocity of the effector. And we compute the velocity through the <coughs> um, through the Jacobian. So uh, let me remember where was the interaction dynamics, the expression of the of the compliant contact model is this one. So we go back to the code. Now let's use the inverse dynamics, the nice one. And let's compute the Velocity at the end effector as the Jacobian times the QD, the velocity of the joints. We enable the contact force to enter in this if condition. We should add uh, this to the uh, J. Okay, the common transpose.fm, the torques, and then we compute fm. So um, oh, let me check. Um, I think I changed this. Okay, no. Okay, yeah. So if uh, the projection of the P0, which is the, our, our contact point, that in our case in the Z direction is just the zero um, component. So in this case, uh, P0 is here, is 0, 0, 0. Okay. 
So conf dot n, which is the normal, which is the uh, zero zero one uh, array. We do the dot product with the conf p zero minus the position of the end effect. And we know that if this is bigger than zero, it means that the end effect is penetrating in the environment and we should compute the force. And to, uh, to compute the force, we first uh, do the, this expression. Km p0 minus p minus dm p dot zero. So Km conf p0 minus p plus conf dm dot so, sorry minus because we are only having the, we have no reference for velocity. PD, okay. Then <clears throat> we said that we want to start um, with a normal force. So we don't want to apply tangential, that our contact is creating tangential forces. So we project this force that you just computed, if it is 3D, into uh, the normal. So we do a dot product for this, this force. And then this becomes a scalar. So we apply this to, again, we multiply by the normal. Let's call it this way. So this is scalar. We apply along the norm. Else, if there is the and the factor is not penetrating the environment. We set it to zero. See the force is only vertical. And you have uh, for the joints that are um, the elbow joint, you see that you have a tracking error because of the of the action of the of the external force. So the the robot is not really penetrating the ground. But instead of using a, a, a normal force, now we want to uh, consider uh, the 3D force. But because the 3D force needs the position of the contact point in the XY direction, we need to sample it. So if you want to consider the full 3D force, we get, in essence, uh, 
we, we did a check whenever the end effect is penetrating. And the first time um, we uh, initialized the contact sample variables at the beginning to false. And whenever the, we enter in the contact, we save the value of the position of the end effector at the contact in the variable P0, and we set the flag to true. Okay. And then we com compute the um, contact force. And this time we keep the contact force without the projection. Full 3D effect. Okay, else, else, we see, we, we do it here. Um, this is, else we, um, whenever the end effect is not penetrating, we put the flag to false such that we, at the next contact, we can take another value of the P0 and update it. And we set the, uh, the contact force to zero. Now, if we simulate, we see that the force now is no longer vertical. And the robot is, is bouncing again. Now, remember that our forward, forward Euler integration is not good for stiff systems and stiff systems um, are when for example we have different dynamics and especially if we use a compliant contact model uh, very with very stiff parameter so for example let's try to increase the stiffness and the damping a lot and see what happens. Is a simulation, and it's becoming unstable. Okay, so this is an example for which the forward order integrator is not good for for compliance system, for a stiff uh, a differential equation. So the only way we can do is to try to reduce the simulation time or the sampling time. And of course, the simulation will be slower, but the system still is not stable. We increase too much. Try to make it even smaller. Actually, it's 100 times slower now. Right? Is that the startup? Well, anyway, <clears throat> we should be able to, to see that is, is, that is a, if you play around with the stiffness of the terrain and the damping and the, the sampling time, you should be able to, to verify that this phenomenon, that the system might become stable and uh, if you decrease the sampling time, you, you might recover you, you can keep the system stable, the integration stable for, uh, so you, when we talk about stability here, it's about the integration scheme, so about the simulation, not about the control. 
and if you reduce the sampling time, the, the simulation integration step, which corresponds to the sampling time in our in our lab, you you might be able to uh, have a stable a stable integration and uh, accurate simulation, but is also uh, slow. So what you're gonna do now is to uh, think that um, our contact point is not really glued to the ground, so the, um, the floor cannot apply whatever uh, tangential force to the, to the end effector. But there is a limit, and this limit is due to the Coulomb friction. And the Coulomb friction model tells us that the tangential force, the maximum one that the floor is able to apply, depends on the uh, friction coefficient that on its half, on its behalf, depends on the nature of the contacting surfaces. So we want to incorporate. Uh, friction cones uh, in this in this simulation to make it more realistic and to co incorporate friction cones we in essence clamp the tangential forces uh, using a uh, friction coefficient of uh, one and to clamp the uh, to implement a friction cone we think about the cone and we do a pyramid approximation okay so we think about the force should stay inside the contact force should stay inside this this pyramidal approximation and you can approximate <coughs> the pyramid uh, so you can uh, model the pyramidal approximation uh, with uh, uh, inequalities so with uh, all spaces so if you look at the um, if you slice the pyramid uh, this way you see that the you have these two inequalities so Whenever the horizontal component of the contact force is bigger than the uh, um, the vertical component times the um, the mu, which is this inside uh, in essence is is, um, is out of this this line, then we clamp uh, to this value. So whenever this is bigger than this, it means that it's outside of this line and is going to be clamped. To, to this, uh, to the edge of the pyramid. This is the other inequality. So whenever it's lower than the minus of this, so uh, you have this, this inequality. Uh, I think there is an error here. This is minus, minus, um, I think there's an error. Um, I, will, I will correct this. And the same for the y direction. So these are the two inequalities for the for the y direction. Uh, whatever the force gets out of the cone, it will be clamped to the cone. And let's see. Uh, I already implemented this here because it's quite uh, long. And let's see what happens. We have also um, um, a plot that is a plot of a cone. Um, so we clamp the x component here and the y component here, and we publish the cone through the function add cone. Ah, sorry, uh, I I remember I need to. Go back to my values here of simulation step. You see here that the force is always inside the cone, so we are not really clamping it. Okay. And the, the contact is not sliding. So how can we make the contact slide?
that's reduced the mu. And a value that I found out was good to make it slide, slip, it was 0.2. So now we simulate <coughs> again. And we see that you have, oh, I don't understand why it's entering in the plane. It should not. Let's, let's slow down the motion. We have a slow factor here. We can tune to 10. Okay. Okay. Uh, maybe I did something wrong in the code. It should not enter in the. I will check this, but uh, it should work in the in the in the in the in the code that is in the in the lab. And you see here, what whenever the robot is slipping, um, the the is whenever the contact force is lying, uh, is trying to uh, get out of the cone, is clamped on the cone. Okay, I think there is a problem in the sampling of the. Of the contact. Ah, yeah, sure. That's the reason. You need to apply the for this clamping only whenever the force is computed. No, no, by the way, we will, uh, we will double check this. Um, do you have any question about what we did so far? Okay, so we can do a 10 minutes break because we have the last lab to do and there's quite a lot of things to be done. And um, let's meet at 45.
let's start again. Um, so now we go on to the final uh, lab of this of this course, which is uh, uh, the uh, implementation of a controller in the Cartesian space in the also controller for the orientation. You can uh, get this last uh, updated code uh, from the local sim. You pull the master and you do get some module update. And then you should be able to find it in the uh, lab description folder uh under the pdf uh, uh l3 task space control and apart from the uh, uh, introduction here which is very similar you uh, tells you how to do the setup i show you before for the spider and uh, um, to launch the the the, the robot uh, to check everything is all right but uh, this the structure is very similar to the previous lab. So uh, the first assignment is to uh, create a sinusoidal reference, but this time uh, not for the joints, but for the directions uh, of the uh, Cartesian direction of the end effect. Uh, in specific, we want to create a sinusoidal reference for the X direction of 1.1 meter, so 10 centimeter. That is changing at uh, frequency of 1.5 Hertz starting from the initial configuration, P0. And we want to keep the other direction, Y and Z, that's zero. Then after four seconds, we want to stop the sign and give a constant reference during one second uh, more. <clears throat> and we need to remember, as in the case of the joints, that we need to create consistent references also for velocity and accelerations of the end effect. And the second is a step uh, reference generation. Uh, again, uh, do a step reference for the Z direction <clears throat> and keep the other ones uh, at zero. And very similar to what we did um, for the uh, joint space, now the variables are no longer only the joints, but also the position of the end effector, with, which we initialize at zero. And um, P0 is just um, computed from the Q0 configuration, right? Doing the forward kinematics and computing the uh, translational part of the uh, forward kinematics um, relate, relative to the uh, configuration uh, Q0. So we compute the end effector position consistent with the Q0 configuration. And zero for the uh, uh, initial velocity and initial acceleration. Then very similar to uh, what we did for the joints, uh, we can create a sinusoidal reference. I won't repeat because uh, this is just um, very similar and there is nothing to gain into this. Just to remember, pay attention that this PDES variable is no longer a 60 NumPy array, but it's a 3D NumPy array. And <clears throat> the consistent uh, velocity is just a cosine uh, scaled uh, with a 2 pi uh, frequency and uh, amplitude. Uh, scalar factor and then the uh, consistent acceleration is the uh, a minus sign with uh, again uh, a scaling factor at the beginning. Then after uh, the four seconds, which is the duration of the sign, we set the constant reference to back to P0. Uh, the sign, the step reference is very similar. Uh, so after two seconds, sorry, um, the the amplitude here we said it was uh, should be 0.1 uh, meter for the x variable and zero for the other variables, and the frequency is 1.5 hertz, and of course zero for the x and y direction. The initial joint position is the same. And for the step reference, we said that we want uh, 
uh, 0.1 step at two seconds in Z direction. So this is uh, here. Uh, if time is bigger than two, we put a point uh, increment, 0.1 meter increment on the Z direction, starting from P0, and of course, zero velocity and acceleration. And then uh, before uh, this, uh, two seconds, we keep the position, desired position at the initial configuration, initial position of the then the factor. <clears throat> These are just the uh, reference signal. We don't do much with them. Uh, again, we have the computation of the uh, inertia matrix, uh, centrifugal Coriolis and gravity terms or gravity terms alone. And here we have the, um, what we need is the uh, end effector Jacobian. And to compute the end effector Jacobian, we use the function frame Jacobian, where we define again the ID of the name of the frame um, that we define here, which is EE link. And we get the ID from the function get frame ID. And Providing this ID and setting this um, this uh, local water line allows us to uh, you don't need this sorry uh, you, it allows us to obtain the Jacobian in the word frame expressed in the word frame. Since we are defining um, we are talking about the end effector, we will ask uh, the first assignment to implement a, a, a Cartesian PD in end effector. We need to take the first three rows of the Jacobian. Okay. In fact, um, the first assignment is to uh, implement a Cartesian space PD control for the position of the end effector. That's why the, the word Cartesian. And this Jacobian so is a, a three times six matrix that if you transpose it, it becomes a six times three matrix. And we'll map uh, D and the factor error times the Cartesian stiffness. If you remember, we saw this, you saw this with Octavio and the Cartesian damping uh, with a velocity error into torques, okay? So this is just a, a, like a virtual force that achieves this, emulates this stiffness and damping very similar to the to the evidence that we saw yesterday. But this virtual force is mapped through the uh, Jacobian transpose because it's a virtual force at the end effector into torques. And this torque will create this control law at the end effector. We set the damping uh, to 300 and the uh, stiffness to 1000. Pay attention that these numbers are different from the joint state case, because we are talking about radiant in the joint state and uh, about meters in, uh, in, in, this, um, in, this, in this case. So these are a different unit of measure. They are Newton over meter for the stiffness and Newton second over meter for the, for the damping. Um, we try to implement this, this uh, Cartesian space PD control. Uh, let me spend you uh, a few words on the extra question for LODE. Uh, which is to implement uh, an inverse kinematic approach. So you remember the very first slide of Octavio lecture on task uh, space control is that uh, a way to implement, to move the end effector uh, in a specified trajectory at the end effector is to first do uh, inverse kinematics, both at the position, velocity and acceleration level, and then uh, to close the loop at the joint level. So use the approaches that we explained in the previous lab and just map the uh, uh, trajectory from the end effector to the, to the joint uh, level. And this is the extra question for Lode. But uh, let's implement uh, uh, this strategy. Uh, pay attention that this, um, you, will see, you will see what is the issue with this, with this approach. So uh, we have, Again, the uh, position of the end effector that we need. This will uh, be useful afterwards. We will compute, we will talk about that afterwards. 
So we need a position and then the factor. And to do so, we take a phrase play, frame placement uh, function. We evaluate uh, the forward kinematics and we take the translational part. And uh, for the uh, velocity and the factor, we just multiply the Jacobian. We just computed the three times six matrix times QD. Then um, the PD control law is the one we just saw tau equal to j transpose dot conf kx with um, control bar you can get the uh, variables if you, you need to install this in spider this um, um, this utility uh, pip install rope and you will have the utility to have the auto completion in spider and this is uh, so p des the desired and the factor position minus the actual and the factor position plus the derivative term in the cartesian space which is dx dot p d des minus p okay that should be fine let me check um Yeah, we could we could uh, call this the virtual force just to be more redundant in, in terminology. F this, and then we do the J transpose here. Okay. So now let let's play this. Um, let's set this configuration to have interactive shell. And we have this weird behavior. Do you guys, somebody of you know, have an idea of why this is happening? Is there a redundant robot for what? For controlling on the task of the position of the end effect, correct. So what we need to, to solve this, what we, ex we explained in, uh, in the case of redundant robots, we need to add a postural task. And okay, let's add a postural task. So let's check. Uh, How the postural task is written. Well, actually, we can we can better look at the PDF here. So a postural task is something we can try to keep the joint uh, that is trying to keep the joint at the Q zero configuration with some uh, stiffness and damping, fifty and ten. So let's do that. So zero. Well, equal to fifty uh, k. Uh, and so I uh, six. Uh, dot q des uh, q, q zero minus q minus ten uh, six dot q dot okay and what we do is we had we add um, this postural task to the uh, torques.
Q0 is conf Q0, of course. Okay, we have our step. The thing is no longer wobbling around. We have a lot of tracking errors, but at least uh, we remove the indeterminacy. Now, what if we want we want to avoid because we are adding these torques, these these two controllers together, and they can be in conflict because the postural task tries to keep the end factor in the in the default configuration Q zero. The end effector task try to to, to track the end effector position. So let's try, for example, to, to check the sinusoid. What happens? Oh, you see something. Now the postural task has very low gains, 50. Maybe it's not affecting so much. But to completely... Uh, to completely remove the influence of the of a postural task on the end effector, you remember that we can employ the uh, null space projector. Okay. So uh, yeah, this and this. Uh, um, so if we implement the null space projector this way, we can project the torques tau zero into uh, torques that do not affect the motion of the end effector. So sorry, I increased the thing. We get the uh, new space projector here. To compute the new space projector, we need the episode inverse of J transpose. And to compute the episode inverse, we need to do uh, J, J transpose inverse times J. So remember for a skinny matrix, we, we use this. And then we, uh, the new space projector for our skinny matrix is I identity matrix minus J transpose, so the inverse of J transpose. And using this N, we can uh, project the tau zero value. That we can call tau node. Okay. Now you see the motion is different. The two tasks are not fighting each other against each other as before. The postural task is less disturbing the, the end effector motion and the tracking is, is slightly nicer. Now there is still many errors, uh, tracking errors, especially at the, uh, uh, during the transient at, at, the, at, the, at the steady state. So similarly to what we did before, let's add a gravity compensation term. And since we are talking about the Cartesian space, we want to map the Cartesian, uh, reflect the gravity vector at the joints at the end effector and sum, it, sum that here. So we get uh, the F des, and we add to the F des the gravity compensation term, which is plus J transpose inverse. In this case, we do the pseudo inverse, but you, you could, uh, sorry, uh, this is wrong, actually, yes. We should use the absurd inverse. So this is this is wrong because the inverse of a Jacobian, which is rectangular, doesn't exist. So this I will correct this. <clears throat> so we use absurd inverse times uh, G. Right now, and then we um, use this.
Oh, sorry, this is the postural task. We complement the previous exercise. It is no longer needed. We simulate Cartesian controller with gravity compensation. We don't see much a difference from the motion, but we do find a difference in terms of the plot. But if you look at the plot, you see that in the steady state, the error disappears. We still have error in the, in the transient. And so what we can try to do, do similarly what, what we did before, uh, try to add a fit forward term to improve the tracking during the transient. So the difference is that this time um, we should use um, uh, the inertia at the end effector uh, that is lambda. Um, so to compute lambda, uh, we will use this expression, not this one, because it's the one that we use for redundant robot, where this inverse always exists. And it exists given that the J matrix has full row rank. If there's no full row rank, then this becomes singular. And we will see we need to do uh, a dumping compensation for to compute the, 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 the inertia. So this is the reflecting inertia at the end of factor. Um, yeah. So we. Uh, move this forward. And we use the lambda, which we computed uh, as we did before. J inverse of the inertia matrix, M inf uh, times J transpose, everything inverse. And we take lambda and we multiply times dot PD, yes. Note that here we are not taking the diagonal element. Um, so let's do whatever we did before and p diag and we do coefficient wise multiplication with pdd des which is the um, acceleration uh, sorry, I didn't put the, the um, ah, yeah, here. So we are adding this term, okay? Okay, let's simulate. we see that the tracking is improved. At least uh, the joint that is moving is, is improved, is tracking. We still have the, this, the, the tracking error at the end because of the non-smoothness of the reference trajectory and at the beginning because of the initial state. We still have, however, the inertial coupling here. So you see that the inertial coupling and the end factor, they affect the fact that one uh, direction is uh, the other direction are, 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 um, are, are not achieving a, a constant tracking, reference tracking. So um, what we can do is to implement finally the task space inverse dynamics, which is a centralized uh, control approach. It takes into account the, uh, all the joint uh, 
couplings. And we, as Octave explained you, we implement inverse dynamics this way. So we give a feed forward uh, acceleration at the end of factor, uh, the Cartesian PD, and this is the virtual force. And then we feedback linearize the system by uh, multiplying by this virtual force times lambda, which is the end of factor, uh, the joint space inertia reflected at the end of factor plus uh, summing the uh, corollaries and uh, inertial and gravity terms um, reflected at the end of factor as well. And then since this is something that is at the end of factor, like a virtual force at the end of factor, we multiply uh, for Jacobian transpose. And this allows us to achieve a, a set, a, a single mass uh, of uh, unitary mass uh, at the end of factor, the, the, make the end of factor behave as a unitary mass. So uh, we take this forward. We compute the um, FDES as PDD DES is our acceleration plus the PD term. We don't put the gravity here, but we do, <coughs> we compute the move as J uh, transpose inverse dot H minus lambda. And here, remember, we have the uh, J dot Q dot term that we will compute here. Um, now, Pinocchio is very smart. And how you would you compute uh, the j dot q dot? So the idea that the guys had is to compute the uh, acceleration of the of that frame, the linear acceleration of the frame. So compute the uh, linear and angular acceleration with the frame classic acceleration, take the linear part. So this is the linear acceleration. You remember that p dot dot is equal to j q dot dot plus j dot q dot. If you set the q dot dot to zero, then you get the j dot q dot. So instead of putting q dot dot to compute the forward acceleration, we put zero, we put none. This means, this, what, what remains is just the j dot q dot, which is a vector, and we can use it here. So we never separate, uh, we never take the finite difference of j to compute j dot. It's very inefficient and very inaccurate. We use this method because in the end, in our control law, we never have to use the j dot separately, but we use always j dot multiplied by q dot. So this is a trick. <coughs> and our new variable is computed. And then we have the lambda variable we already computed here. So we put uh, lambda dot f this plus mu. OK. plus the torques due to the null space uh, postural task. Now we simulate. The computer is just a bit slow because of the zoom. But now we see that the tracking is perfect. Here we have a very small numerical error. Also here it's just a very small numerical error. So these two directions are almost, uh, the tracking is almost perfect. And also here the, the tracking looks very good. <clears throat> now, uh, an alternative approach that I'll show you that allows you to prevent to allows you to avoid to compute this new variable and the J transpose, Turing inverse, 
is to uh, directly compensate for the uh, bias effects for the centripetal Coriolian gravity at the joint level. So we just have the attractor here, the, the controller, the control law, and we uh, do the uh, multiplication for lambda and use this thing. This uh, prevents us to compute the j dot q dot and then j dot to the inverse term. It's less elegant, but uh, we expect to have uh, a very similar behavior. So if you want to implement that, maybe it's convenient to use that this expression rather than the other one. Okay, you see you have more or less the same uh, uh, tracking errors. Now, what happens if we add an external force? Again, we have our external force flag. We, we want to add uh, um, um, 200 Newton external force in the Z direction after one second. So in the code, we do something very similar to what we did. J transpose external force after one second. And let's simulate. Ah, let's use, sorry, let's use the, um, you see this is the force, 200 Newton, so it's bigger. Uh, but let's use a, a constant, uh, yeah, you can see, you can see here, very nice. Okay, the force is on the Z direction and mainly affects the Z component, but the motion still is a nice tracking in the, in the X direction. And this is because our model is linearized. So with figure linearization with inverse dynamics, we managed to linearize the model and have such that we have no influence between one, one uh, uh, direction and the other. And the last point is about controlling orientation. <clears throat> controlling orientation is, is uh, quite tricky. Um, I would like to just use my code here because uh, time is running out. So, and uh, we still have uh, quite some discussion to do. And so controlling orientation allows us to define a 6D task because we control not only the position of the end effector, but also the orientation of the frame attached at the end effector. So the postural task is no longer needed, it's not necessary because the dimension of the task is the same of the dimension of the joint, of the joint space. And Remember that now with orientations, we have problem due to the fact, how do we represent orientation? Which parameterization we choose to represent orientation and how to compute the orientation error. So to uh, compute the uh, um, or a controlled orientation, let's first implement a PD control law <clears throat> and use the angle axis representation to compute the orientation error W E zero. We need to remember that now our Jacobian is six by six. So we use the J six we, we saw before. And we, uh, in essence, uh, first, we want to define the desired orientation that we want, and we define this way, like, uh, remember, a matrix can be uh, uh, a stack, vertical uh, stack of the uh, columns of the representing the axis of the desired frame D expressed in the uh, original frame W, which is the word frame, 
and we want the uh, x-axis along the uh, uh, the same as the w-axis, x-axis, uh, the y-axis opposite, and the z-axis opposite. This is equivalent to rotate uh, uh, to rotate uh, uh, the four wall frame 180 degrees with respect to its x-axis and obtain this desired frame. <clears throat> okay, so uh, we see this here in the orientation control. Uh, to obtain the, uh, to control the orientation, we need also the actual orientation of the end effector, which is represented by the rotation matrix WRE and is computed again with the four kinematics evaluating just the, um, with the with the frame placement function at the uh, actual position of the joints in taking the dot rotation field, which represents the rotation matrix. So this is returning an homogeneous transform. If you take the dot translation one, you take the uh, the, tra the translational part, and if you take the dot rotation, you take the, the, the rotation matrix. Um, we need also the velocity, the angular velocity of the end effector. So using the J6, you get both the uh, angular, uh, the linear velocity and the angular velocity that is we call twist is a 60 vector. So J times Q dot is a 60 uh, vector. And we extract just the uh, last three rows. Uh, and this, uh, sorry, the, the, last three, the last three elements that represent the angular velocity of the end effector. Everything is expressed in the warframe, so I don't, Put any any uh, prepend any any prefix. Um, whatever we we ask uh, is this uh, rotation matrix to be uh, this x-axis the same as the word frame axis, the y-axis uh, flipped and the z-axis flipped. And these are the columns. So we do the transpose and we vertical stack them uh, in, together to create this wr. Des matrix. Then uh, we want the, uh, in this case, the uh, desired, uh, we need also the, uh, to implement a PD control law, a desired uh, angular velocity, and we set it to zero. And then um, we need to. <coughs> Computer orientation error. You remember the lecture of yesterday. Uh, given the uh, um, actual orientation and the desired orientation, we can compute the uh, relative rotation matrix uh, this way. And then uh, compute the orientation error from um, uh, the angle axis representation uh, associated to this rotation matrix. So first, let's compute the matrix. Uh, it's uh, um, the uh, transpose of the WRE, which we evaluated before, uh, dot uh, times the uh, desired uh, orientation we just computed. And then to compute the angle axis, we have two methods, one with the arcosine and one with the atanchu. We Let's use the uh, atanchu method which is uh, computing the, uh, the delta theta uh, scalar in, uh, with the Atanchu function and the uh, R, R hat uh, axis uh, using the, uh, the, the formula we, we talked at the lecture. And then we employ uh, um, um, as orientation error, the uh, convention to multiply the axis times the uh, delta theta. And this obtain uh, from from this we obtain a three D vector in the Euclidean um, in in, a, in an Euclidean vector in a, in a Cartesian space, and pay attention that this vector is expressed in the in the factor frame, so we need to rotate it uh, to map to the uh, to the world frame. And why we want to rotate? Because whenever we want to build uh, our PD control action. So these are just the way you compute delta theta and the axis. 
uh, and to this is the mapping to the word frame. So to compute the um, PD control action, we need to obtain a, a, a virtual force and moment that is expressed in a word frame because our Jacobian transpose is this expressed is expressed in a word frame. So to we need to compute a zero which is consistent with the with the word frame expressed in the word frame as well. We have the KO, which is the um, a three, a six times six, sorry, this is a three times three matrix, uh, which represent the torsional uh, stiffness, okay, to, uh, to track the orientation, and this is the torsional damping. Torsional damping is multiplied by the error in angular velocity, desired angular velocity and angular velocity, and the torsional stiffness is multiplied by the uh, orientation error. So bigger the error, the bigger is the returning moment. And this is the virtual moment at the end effect. Okay. Then what we do, we stack together the virtual moment with the virtual force that we computed previously in the linear case. And we obtain a 60 vector, which we call desired branch. And then uh, we do uh, PD control. Uh, so uh, the Cartesian PD uh, this time is 60. So we use the 60 Jacobian transpose times the uh, branch, and we can even add a, a, a gravity compensation term. So this is uh, gamma dels is the uh, virtual moment. And this is the stack of the F dels we computed before. I need to uh, take it, uh, it's here. So we no longer need the postural task. F test is computed here. We stack them together and we, we multiply with the Jacobian transpose. Then uh, we have our torques and we uh, provide the torques to the simulation. Let's try to simulate this. Okay, we forgot to. <laughs> To remove the contact force, but that's good. So you see that the uh, the frame, the end effect of frame is uh, as the Z component flip and the Y component flip. Um, let's remove the contact force from next exercise, and you can see uh, here that this is the position of the vector, which remains. Uh, unaffected, and this is the uh, orientation error that is going to zero. Okay, now if we want to use the uh, Euler angles to uh, see the tracking, we can use, for example, the um, function rot to Euler angles, which maps the uh, rotation matrix in, uh, in Euler angles. And then um, something we can do is instead of defining the desired orientation in terms of <coughs> a rotation matrix, we can find the uh, a desired uh, sequence of Euler angles and map them uh, using the dual function, which is L to rot into the desired rotation matrix. And let's see what's happening. And you see that this is exactly the uh, desired orientation we set with Euler angles. It's very convenient. But Okay, these are the Euler angles, tracking, position tracking, orientation error. Okay, this is very fine. Uh, but you remember that Euler angles, they have issues in terms of singularities. Whenever, for example, we set a pitch of pi half. So let's see what happens whenever we set a set of Euler angles with a, a pitch of 90 degrees.
and you see here that so we are not closing the loop in the in the in, in, we are using, closing the loop at the end of, at the orientation error level so that's why we the robot doesn't get crazy but this is just to show you what happens uh, with Euler angles, whenever they are getting close to the singularity, they completely get non-meaningful, non-meaningful uh, uh, results. So this is what we should get: something like that goes into that and start to 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 keep the orientation constant. Now um, let's define. Uh, um, let's see another problem with Euler angles that you uh um you don't know so you you you, you i want to show you this uh whatever happens whenever we sign we set a sinusoidal trajectory for example to the desired trajectory we put a sign on the roll zero on pitch and zero on yo and a consistent uh, yo rate uh, um, error angles rate and error angles acceleration and then we uh, um, define this 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 reference trajectory for the other angles. Uh, we are we are sure that we are far away from the singularity because we set the zero pitch, so we won't have the singularity problem. But uh, uh, we can um, we see that we have another issue. Um, that is the uh, unwrapping uh, the wrapping phenomenon. So whenever the other angles goes because beyond this is also also for presentation are beyond pi it will flip to minus pi so um and remember that if you are defining the desired trajectory uh um uh, time varying desired trajectory uh, with Euler angles you need to compute the uh, omega des and the omega dot des using um the the mapping uh, between Euler rates uh, and uh, uh, omega and uh, the same for the acceleration for the acceleration you have the derivative of this mapping which is this one so uh, if you have omega equal to uh, t the t matrix the representation matrix which I, uh, times the Euler rates to have omega dot you differentiate that and you get t phi dot dot des plus t dot uh, phi dot des. And these are all functions that are available in the MathUtils uh, package inside the locosim, and therefore you can compute the omega dot des. And then, um, so we don't longer need the, so uh, from omega dot des, Let's see, um, yeah, so uh, from the Euler rates, we computed the uh, desired uh, um, and the factor thing, uh, rotation matrix, then we uh, compute the relative orientation and we use whatever we did before. And see that now we have um, a sinusoid reference for the role. So this is like a drilling, uh, and procedure that rotates the the factor frame uh, in one side and the other and you see whatever i told you before that if you if you are using the um, orientation error that is fine but with the uh, with the Euler rates you have the flipping between pi and minus pi and to solve this issue there is this uh, wrapping and wrapping uh, feature that you can implement and solve the uh, the problem. So we just uncomment this. Okay, I'm almost at the end. And you see now that the, we don't have anymore the, wind, the wrapping phenomenon. 
uh, you still have uh, tracking errors just because we we are starting from a different states we we are doing a pd control action we have um, uh, couplings so the very last uh, uh, exercise is to implement uh, the full uh, 60 inverse dynamics that consider a task uh, with uh, uh, six dimension for the orientation and for the uh, position of the end factor. The problem of this uh, um, in this situation is that the Jacobian uh, it can be singular, and actually it is singular. So its rank drop, drops in some configuration from six to five. And so to uh, compute the uh, um, both the pseudo inverse and the um, and the um, the uh, uh, and the factor inertia reflected uh, uh, sorry the factor inertia you need to add a damping term so you need to add uh, a, a very little uh, raw value that we can set to 0 0.0001 here and uh, multiply by the identity matrix and this ensures that you are able to invert this matrix that otherwise would be singular and also this one and then we apply the same idea as before uh, the difference here is that we no longer use the uh, fdes but we use the uh, full 60 vector with the virtual uh, force uh, that achieves the pd action um, and the virtual moment and uh, we feed the cleanerize the system at the in the factor level and if we do so so we have uh, the raw we compute the lambda uh, we sum up inside the uh, before doing the inverse we sum up the raw squared uh, times the identity six times six and then we compute the pseudo inverse and then we need the j dot q dot uh, 6d because we are considering the full uh, uh, 60 task compute the mu uh, for the uh, 60 case so use the 60 pseudo inverse uh, and uh, compute from the 60 jacobians and then we do you do the j dot uh, j transpose dot uh, lambda uh, and here we stack the uh, PD action with the acceleration linear and the uh, omega dot desired uh, plus the uh, virtual moment we compute from the PD action. So we, we have a 60 vector, which is this desired range that we, 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 we show in, in here. Plus we have the, uh, the new. And we, if we simulate this, finally, Sorry, we don't print the position. And we see that uh, we have a nice tracking. Right. We still the contact force. The initial transient is due to the fact that we we are not setting the initial value uh, initial state equal to the initial um, position yeah but the tracking is it's very good in the, during the transient so we no longer have the uh, Coping uh, inertial effect. And 
So if we, you will have an initial state consistent, you will achieve uh, perfect tracking. And this is the uh, end of the, of the lab. Um, if you have any question, Otherwise, I take the chance to uh, thank you for, for attending the course. And uh, there is a possibility next week to have to follow a, an, a, um, an optional lecture where we do exercises for the exam. Um, so I think next Monday we can we can have this this lecture. Otherwise, uh, to the ones that are in, subscribe to the exam of the seven, I, I see you. I see you there. Feel free to uh, ask me any question by email um, and contact us for any doubt, even for the for the labs. You you can <clears throat> check the text of the labs and do the labs yourself to better understand things. You see that these labs are the implementation of all the concept we we explained that during the lectures so they are very useful and uh, uh, pay attention that i'm continuously updating the text because i find and the code because i find some typos and improvements so if you want to be sure just uh, download the latest version of the slides and of the labs okay so see you uh, see everybody and thanks for attending the course Thank you. Thank you a lot. Bye. Bye-bye.